Dan Hooker. Welcome. Mine didn't make two. that much of a noise, but yeah, between two beers. <laughs> that's, well, that's now I got. Now I actually am between two. You beers. are. So I've set it up between two beers. I feel more comfortable. Dan, now. Dan opened one as soon as he got in here, and he wanted to <laughs> do one with me. That's the first. Tradition. That's the first ever synchronized opening from the Export nice, Beer Garden nice. Studio that we've oh, ever had. Oh, so thank I, you very I, much. I'm actually an Export fan. Well, oh, I'm yes. being honest. I'm being honest. Like um, beautiful drop. Been drinking it for years. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> probably a bit, probably a bit younger than Export Gold would uh, suggest. So I've been drinking this since I was about fourteen. So well, there's, there's about well, good fifty yeah. thousand. Fifty thousand. Um, yeah. We'll clip that out. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep that going. On yeah, hundred percent. There's, there's about fifty thousand uh, cases in here as well, so you could probably uh, take off with, with oh, some please, after, afterwards. Please, please, good Export please Gold chat. Thank you. Hey, um, so we often keep a bit of an eye on the sort of social media of the guest of our guests a few days before they come on to see what they've been up to and we did notice that yesterday uh during the ufc card there might have been a bit of content coming out from the wiggles from from oh, your end was, it yeah. was this is my second year running going to the, the wiggles <laughs> concert it's definitely not my usual uh spot at vector arena I'm usually <laughs> in there <laughs> usually in there knocking someone out or, or or trying to at least um but nah it's cool hey eh? day with the family took uh my daughter who's just turning four in November, and then um, my nieces and my sister. So it's just like a good family day out. Like, it's cool. It's cool. It's trippy seeing, like, people recognize you at the Wiggles like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's giving me, like, a second take. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> was it, were they running parallel, like, with the two events? Like, it was right at the same time as the UFC pay-per-view yeah, yeah, yesterday? Yeah, yeah, the UFC, yeah, the UFC pay-per-view was on. So usually I do, like, a post-fight show. Um, with my mate after, well, I had to let him know. I had to say, "Mate, I'm not watching the UFC today. I got got a day with the family at the Wiggles," and he's just like, "Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. We'll can it. We'll can it till we'll can it till next week." Hell of a one to miss. I did catch the main event. <laughs> That's why I, I got back. I got home in time for the the co-main event and main event. So yeah, I did. I did catch it. Actually, you're like, um, if I'm being honest, I, I was on my phone when he. Well, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 had I, it, think, I had it going as well. Speaking, and I, speaking thing. like half the boys at the gym, and we, yeah, we were on Twitter and then looked up and just saw Usman lying there. And we were like, oh shit, we might have missed something quite good there. <laughs> <laughs> well, they replayed it enough. Oh, that sucks though. That that's painful, you know, because that's that's the moment that you remember. Like the, our sport is like entirely about moments, like moments in history. It's like because I had someone say that to me, they're like, that's what people remember. They don't remember like at the end of the day when it's all said and done. They don't remember like wins or losses or what you said or what this like. They they remember like the moments that they made you feel. You know what I mean? And because I do get like a lot of people from oh man, I was there in Victor Arena, your debut, and then when you knocked them out, the the crowd and like the Ross Pearson, and then because that was like deafening, like the land of their knee, and I just I actually went deaf, like I because I completely just blocked the crowd out. As so well, I was like, I'm just gonna pretend like this i'm not here you know what i mean like, i'm gonna pretend like absolutely no one is here not ten thousand people that you actually know like <laughs> i'm gonna pretend like there's no one here but then like once the knee landed he dropped like finished and i just said bah! like i just went deaf and i was like oh yeah shit, that's right there's people here <laughs> were there any uh, were there any pops like that at the wiggles yesterday when they came out <laughs> uh, i'm gonna be honest uh, i don't know if i went two years running but last year was better Oh wow! Well, they had Robert Rackett. Yeah. He he was there, so he's usually you know they, they brought like the kiwi flavor to it. They got a new um, yellow wiggle too. Like <laughs> Emma's Emma's my daughter's favorite too. So I'm, I don't want to get into them. You know what I mean? I heard yeah. there was a bit of a divorce and a bit of you know yeah, I don't want to yeah, get a bit of drama. It's wiggle. a good little dad. It's a good little dad chat early doors. <laughs> really good little of dad chat. <laughs> What do you know? What do you know? Like the life stories of the of the characters in the Wiggles, like that's yeah. when you're. Well, I caught the, there was a like a just we'll just continue down the Wiggles theme just for a moment, Steve, Please. before before yeah, we transition. On, like an adults only Wiggles, like oh. in the evening. Yeah, yeah. Well, not they, not they like an X rated one okay. or anything like that, but like a like a. It's like a throwback because they had a few of the older cobs there, and they had um even Jeffrey just out the back on the <laughs> piano, and then apparently like they come back and they just they just do like a throwback for the older people. I've never. I don't think I'm ready to come. Kind of, like I'm not that big of a fan. Like only my daughter's like quite into it, so that's the only reason that I, I don't mind going there and um, stamp my feet. But it's, yeah, it's funny as because you you obviously like know some of the songs, you know, and you're just sitting there like <laughs> like clapping along, <laughs> and you just get, like look into the crowd. You see people are like, looking at you like, 
Is that Dan, is that yeah, Dan Hooker? Yeah. Yeah. Is that Dan Hooker? Like, apples, <laughs> yummy, yummy. Because like, what can you do, you know? You can't be a tough guy all the time. Mate. You kind of answered my question. I was wondering if you were going to be the guy who had the UFC kind of on his phone at the Wiggles, you know? It was just like, sort of. I was <laughs> checking, but no, like, lucky enough, there was, um, it was like, Tyson Pedro has done like his last uh, training camp at City Kickboxing. So we're like, I was looking out for that fight, but once I caught like the result of that fight, there was nothing I was really interested in until like the main event. I wanted to see Leon Edwards. So that, besides that, like it was like a good card. Like some of the cards, when it's like the boys are on, yeah. then it's going to be a bit different. <laughs> then I'll, I'll probably yeah. can in the yeah. wiggles on that. <laughs> I'll probably can in the wiggles on that day, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Oh, that's the beauty of podcasts, isn't it? You can do five minutes on the wiggles at the start of an episode. Um, <laughs> but you've, you're have a bit of an OG of the podcast game yourself. And the research I've found that you were host of three podcasts. There's Dan Hooker podcast, which I think there's about 11 eps of. There's the breakdown with Dan Hooker, which was the TAB tipping one, I think. And the Matt Life pub talk series, which I saw uh, the little sort of byline was two men attempt to navigate the world of podcasting without ruining their respective careers. Shit show. Shit show. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a fun one. I was just, um, so uh, that's Oscar from, from the Mac Life. He runs like Conor McGregor's like YouTube channel and stuff like that. Um, and like his Conor McGregor's like media side of things. Uh, Oscar, and he lives in Las Vegas. And then nearing the end of last year or midly, midway last year, like I was stuck in Las Vegas with the lockdowns and now I wasn't able to get a spot into MIQ or anything like that for four months. So I spent like four months of last year um, in Las Vegas. So while I was there, he was like, hey, Dan. Uh, <laughs> <team up>? yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you're, you know, you're not an idiot. Like, you want to have a yarn like once a week? And I was like, yeah, cool. So we just got together in, in Las Vegas there and, um, just had a yarn every now and then. They're, they're, yeah, it's just a bit of fun, really. Yeah. Sounds like a similar concept to Between Two Beers. A couple of drinks, <laughs> a couple of microphones, and, and, just, and just chat. Out of nowhere. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so before we get into the, the sort of career stuff, there's a few little little video bits that we want to talk about that we've highlighted. And there's one, I saw this ages ago, and I was like, man, if we ever get Dan Hooker on, I want to know the story about this. So it's, it's framed as Dan versus Hell's Angel Kickboxer. In this kind of like <laughs> grimy looking is it a, gym, is it a, oh, gar is it a garage? No, that's oh, me, gym. That's me, old gym, Shrek Force. Right. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, I've offended anyone there. But it was like wall to wall people all around, and the caption is kind of like sixteen year old Dan going up against the head of the Hell's Angel kickboxing, <laughs> and so I'm like, and it looked ferocious. Like, do you, do you remember that? Yeah, so that's um like I used to train at a gym out uh, West Auckland called Shrek Force, and uh, yeah, just my my coach. At, um, Aaron was just like, hey, do you want to have a get in there and have because we'd have a every year we'd have a, a called it the Christmas bash and it, it got pretty infamous the old Strike Force Christmas bash as being a bit of a wild party and um, yeah we used to just get all the mats from the gym and then put them on some crates and just stack it up and then instead of like having just doing it in the ring or anything like that like the the idea was like the people can kind of be part of the action. So the people were the ring. So if you oh, wow. you get like knocked back into the ropes, usually you bounce off the ropes, but we were just, people would push you back into like the middle of the ring. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, it's like uh, just a bit of a strike force tradition. And then, uh, yeah, we just, one year, it's uh, Anson Anson. He's um, like part of, the, he's been like a stronghold in the kickboxing community for, for years and years. And uh, Francis as well. So we just had like a bit of a tag thing. It's just a bit of fun between, between mates. Um, yeah, that's all it is. Yes. But yeah, it was funny. I went to, because I was um, a bouncer in town at the time. I was a bouncer down in the Viaduct. So I'll, I had that um, that little like sparring shindig. And then I went to town and then it wasn't until like, the guys I was working with were like, well, what are all those dots on your head? So someone must have had some shady gloves on because I was like, had like knuckle marks like oh, all, no. over my <laughs> <laughs> all over my forehead for the rest of the night. Uh, yeah. How long did you work as a bouncer? Uh, I would have done that for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah a couple of years. Moving, moving my way through town. Okay. I'm actually pretty lenient because I like I just remember growing up and just being an absolute menace. Yeah. So then I, I had like quite a bit of leeway for people. You know what I mean? <laughs> we, we were talking about this <laughs> as kind of people that go out and you see like a doorman or a bouncer and you go, "How's that guy? Uh, <laughs> how's that? 
Oh, yeah, you'd get, be someone bigger yeah, than that guy. Yeah, you get a few looks, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, people, but then, obviously, like, you walk past, like, a like a rake of a white dude, you, like, it's like, you you really want to get beat up by a... <laughs> well, it's also, you, you kind of go, if you know, if you've been around long enough, you realise that's the guy you don't want to fuck with because he's yeah, likely yeah. to be... the Well, like, he's just, like, be able he's to handle just, himself. Uh, yeah, just like a, a tall, skinny white guy standing there with a smile on his face. It's like, maybe... He's yeah. not there for no reason, you know. Most people would put two and two together with, with knuckle marks all across <laughs> his forehead as well. <laughs> <laughs> He's a dangerous one. Um, did you enjoy that line of work? I wonder if obviously you're not trying to get involved in any violence, but the way that you're the safety you have in being able to protect yourself if things do get under con- out of control is that. Bro, most of it's uh, like ninety nine percent of that job is just like just talking to people. Like it's actually it's actually like. To be, honest, like any, any, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, like any trouble actually goes because you're in a bad mood. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not because like people are just drunk. People are gonna be drunk. People like they, you know, they're dicks sometimes. <laughs> it's yeah. just the way it is. But if you can like talk them down, then it's actually, it's actually not that bad. You know what I mean? Like you go on and yeah, there's like just tricks of the trade. Like you just learn from like the older guys and stuff like that. Like you used to just walk up to people and you just like tap on the shoulder. Like because as soon as you walk up to a guy and you're like, I'm kicking you out. Like, like getting grumpy, like I'm gonna grab you, and like as soon as you start making threats like that, like drunk guy's gonna get like hostile, right? Like drunk guy's gonna be like, you're not chucking me out, like I'm not, Ur, like, and he's gonna kick up back, but like or get, like go up, put my arm around him, and just be like, mate, mate, and you just go up into his ear, and you're like, <laughs> and you go what? And you go, <laughs> and you go what? And you go, what? And you go oh. Follow me, follow me, and then he like follows you, and you just walk him out. <laughs> <laughs> you just like you just walk him out, and it's like, "Have a good night, bud." And he goes like, "He's go, what do you, what you? Ah, oh, shit!" Like he clicks over in his head, like, "What happened?" And you just like, there's like sneaky ways to get people out, and then yeah. nine times out of ten, he's just like, he, he's like, "Ah, he got me." Yeah. <laughs> he got me i'll go somewhere else then. man oh, tricks good. of the trade being uh <laughs> being released on between two beers amazing yeah. never thought, i never thought about that yeah it's uh, a, you, but yeah you're in like this and i've been kicked out of a lot yeah, of pubs yeah, by the way too, you know what i mean like they don't like people grabbing hold of me you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. you could do a job as a bouncer shay i've got, I've got I, could, I could talk i could talk my way it's out just of people person like i encourage like because um like you work for wd security with um les and um like that's it. It's just it's just being comfortable in like confrontational situations. So there have been some like younger guys uh, at my gym. You know what I mean? Which are like they're great fighters and stuff like that, but they're like kind of had like a bit more of a sheltered like upbringing, and they're not they're not so good with like the conflict side of things. Like as soon as they're like the walkout or someone's hostile to them or someone's like at their at their way in like being staunch and getting in their face you see them like get a little bit shook so it's like i've directed them kind of towards that line of work just because you get you get very calm in confrontation like confrontation no longer like scares you or or you don't arc up or like react instantly you just someone brings like confrontation to you and you realize that if i give it back like then it's just a a shit storm you know they get kind of getting what they want you know what i mean but like if someone brings confrontation to you and you're like ah it's all right mate like don't worry about it like (laughs) and you can stay like calm in in confrontational circumstances which is very useful um when it comes to combat sports because as soon as you lose your temper you lose like you lose you 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 start breathing shallow you start holding your breath um you get very tired and you fatigue like extremely quickly. So like being being able to be calm when other people lose their cool is is just um, it's just like it's so useful in in combat sports. Maybe maybe that is the third act of my career is to reinvent myself as a, <laughs> it's pod- a fun job. podcast like, if slash doorman. <laughs> <laughs> if I wouldn't, you know, if I wasn't so recognisable, uh, I would I would I would still do yeah, it. It's I, a fun I, gig. I think I've got that problem now as well with the podcast. <laughs> oh, it's going to be too hard. Too hard. <laughs> just put a cap in it, mate. Um, you do. You, you, the more I think about it, you are the perfect doorman because you are so smiley and you look so gentle, but. If push comes to shove, you, you can handle yourself. And it kind of leads nicely into the next clip that I want to talk about, which is um, Izzy's Frenemies clip that on YouTube. It, he's put together this little package. It's like five minutes or something. And it's you and him sort of sparring and just absolutely going at each other in the gym. And then it's you guys watching each other's fights and this sort of 
frenemies, I guess friends and enemies, enemies part is it that you can go hard at each other in the gym and then you're sort of friends afterwards. But he's always talking about love taps and they're like joking about you being such a nice guy, but you're a psychopath when it comes down to it. Like, is there two sides to, to Dan Hooker? Oh, a million percent. Like a million percent. Like this, this, this is because like, I found combat sport and I'm like so comfortable in that sport that I get to, I get to like that, release that side of me. You know what I mean? Like I get to go out there and fight and do all of that stuff every single day and, and crash heads and grind. And so I'm, um, you know, I, I use all that aggression inside of the gym. So when I'm out, I can smile and have fun and, and, go to the wiggles and and you know <laughs> you know what i mean like be like a relaxed person like if i didn't have the sport as like an outlet i feel like it would be put me in some pretty sticky situations but just having the sport is just um yeah it's like saved it saved my life having the sport as a as a as just an outlet for for aggression uh, uh, specifically on that video so so some of those clips have gone viral again i spend too much time on tiktok and i see them all the time <laughs> and it's like it's like is he down in the ball and it's you just like sort of pummeling him but i'm imagining that's very controlled right like you're sparring are you going as hard as you can to replicate a fight like situation and he's defending so or? that's um that workout we do is called spider so you do that like around the time you fight so if you're fighting a saturday night uh, we all come in on a Saturday night, but um, most of us fight. Uh, we, we all know we watch the UFC on Sunday, like midday afternoon. So that's when we do like our spider, and it's like a fight simulation. Like we just do like a bunch of exercises to like fatigue ourselves, and then you just get like like rotated through. So there's no um, th there's like Israel spider. So there's like no winning spider. There's no way you can <laughs> possibly win there. You're just like in the middle, just getting like Shark Tank, like switching guys every like 20 30 seconds like after you're already extremely fatigued so that's what that is he it was funny he was giving me shit about that video and i'm like you posted it <laughs> yeah, on, it's on your, your channel <laughs> it's on your channel like i have a rule no cameras at no cameras at spider like i think we should have a team rule like no cameras because it's obviously like no winning it but like what i'm doing there is um i had someone else like reference that clip i can't remember who it was they were like, oh, you guys are, you know, I thought you guys were the, um, like one of the smartest gyms in the world and you're world champions and this and that, like, and you're just training dumb and giving each other brain damage and things like that. And I was like, no, nah, you obviously don't know what you're looking at. Like, I'm like simulating, like, it's my job during Spider to, to like spike the guy's adrenaline, like get him, give him that feeling of, getting dropped in a fight and then you start remembering oh man there's 50 million people watching this like you know like that if that doesn't spike your adrenaline like nothing will so like that's kind of part of spiders like getting that fight or flight like switched on and and getting the adrenaline spiking and just being able to replicate like handling that adrenaline and not like losing your cool once that adrenaline like completely spikes so like obviously yeah i'm not like actually teeing off on them like uh, most of it's like that intensity is there but like i'm i'm experienced enough in the sport that like i'm mainly like just punching like his shoulders or or like just slapping with like this part of my hand like it's not like you're dropping like full power yeah, yeah. <laughs> like punching shots like in, in that kind of circumstances if, if you wanted to tee off on the guy and stop him like you definitely could <laughs> because there's no winning spider obviously but it's yeah it takes um it's a, yeah it's like the m i'm very good at being controlled and uh, and seemingly uncontrolled like that if that <laughs> makes any yeah. sense yeah that does yeah like no not many people can do that like not many people can simulate that much aggression without actually hurting anyone yeah no it's a real skill like i, I knew it was controlled but it could be taken out of context which is why it pops oh, up in these little percent. videos people a million like, percent people going oh sparring looks pretty and it's like it's not sparring like it's not yeah that's not how our like sparring goes like sparring is like incredibly controlled when we're like yeah <laughs> actually sparring that's that's fight simulation yeah do you ever um sort of strip down the sparring to just one discipline so it's just strike like you and izzy get in there and just have a, a striking or oh, like a boxing percent. match yeah, yeah is thousand percent. It, and how does that go like when when you're just mixing it up with izzy like what what sort of levels are you guys on um he's just a very he it is what it is that's a very hard man to hit like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very it's an incredibly hard man to touch with your hands like he's um, you you can look at it like the history of combat sports, like the people that 
live forever and the people that win the most world titles and go the furthest have the best defense like that's just that's just the fact of the matter like right now you know you see people like oh you know he's not knocking people or like you know what i mean and it's just like that they they don't understand the the combat sport yeah. and and how combat sport like defense wins world titles like defense um is gonna make him like the longest reigning champion in history we saw uh, yesterday with Usman right like he got made one small mistake and now he gets turned into a meme it's like a cruel yeah yeah cruel it's like the cruelest sport in the world yeah you, you have to you have if you're gonna come if you're gonna like participate in it you have to understand that you have to understand that you're like one mistake away from getting memed so like you have to yeah. you have to be smart about it speaking of the cruelest sport in the world the, the, i think the third clip that we were going to refer to i stumbled on the other day and i can't remember the gentleman's name but he went into the cage with you and your leg kicked him twice and <laughs> i think he does a series right it's like yeah 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 yeah, yeah, like yeah, like yeah, yeah like dre, dre skrilla he's a uh comedian well like a celebrity there's nothing funny about what happened <laughs> no, no definitely not definitely not like he just he just messaged me out of nowhere like i've obviously been like following his youtube clips and that like i think he's hilarious you know what i mean and he just messaged me he just messaged me out of nowhere and he's just like yeah like that's because obviously people like see your social media and see you smiling and fucking doing dumb shit at the wiggles and you know looking after your family and that and then they see you and they're like ah nice guy and it's like nah really not <laughs> nice guy like, like it was i've dedicated my life into understanding how to switch people off like yeah. that's yeah yeah yeah, to, yeah. To how to uh, i've dedicated my life to how to destroy the human body like that's really <laughs> that's like, really the long and short of it and then when he just messaged me out of nowhere and he's like hey dan you think it'll be right if i came down to the gym and you give me a couple low kicks and i was just like <laughs> how do you how do you how do you filter a request like that though right because like you say i think he's funny like i i like oh, i was no, more, more so like like you said like you, you can inflict maximum damage on that so does part of you go shit i gotta i gotta manage this here as well because it could you know he's not a fighter you are it, i guess it's that control well that that's Steve it like it's that, well. it's that like level of understanding of like at what point can you seriously hurt it's not like i know i know that point you know what i mean yeah. so it's not um yeah like that was never going to be like any long term damage like a low kick like i i was like a like a week and a half two weeks out from my last fight so i was also like not like going to yeah. go hard enough i break my toe or something i'd look pretty stupid if i did yeah. that you know what i mean so it's, it's like that balance like you i've got a million reps at doing that like if there's if there's anything you can trust me with doing it's that like <laughs> it, it, it's great entertainment like but, it, like because you sit we like we'll sit and what i will sit on a sunday and watch it and go you wince at some of the shots that you see and then that's got a crowd and stuff around it as well but when it's just two dudes isolated yeah, yeah, yeah. isolated kicks. there and it's yeah. yeah it's like that it's like man that is fucking real like no chance in a million years would i ever want to get kicked, <laughs> like get kicked like that you know what i mean no calf kicks yeah <laughs> yeah it was brutal we'll tag that one in the in the show notes yeah. you can have a look um great okay i, I want to start sort of building the the picture of dan hooker so he went to school at mags what was teenage dan like sort of 13 14 15 year old um yeah like i always get i say oh you're a fighter now did you get in many fights like we're always fighting and i said mm, like no more than anyone else i was hanging out with i think it's just like a part of being like a like a youth in new zealand is you just grow up like with that kind of i'm the toughest like or oh, oh, rugby or oh, tackles like you know it's just um it's just part of growing up as like a kid in new zealand and a boy and i kind of just never grew out of that yeah <laughs> i could kind of just knew, <laughs> never grew out of that pissing contest you know what i mean um but was it a martial arts background? Did you go to like? No, nah, no, nah, I was, I was, I was, yeah, for like 13, 14, 15, I was just playing uh, like rugby league or rugby league um, at Bay Ross School and, and at high school as well, just because I like, um, I love that game, like that game of just crashing into each other. Like my whole family's played that game. My dad's, uh, my dad, my uncles, my grandfather, uh, they all played rugby league. So that was just like, I always wanted to be like that. And, and, um, play rugby league and you just watch it and there's just teams of guys like crashing into each other and um it's like that test of manhood that that you all go through as a teenager it's like an adolescent boy thing you know where you're just like i'm gonna 
prove this and test my manhood and stuff like that. So I guess, yeah, you just kind of get caught up like that, playing rugby, playing rugby league, and it's just it's just a fun outlet for that, that aggressive um, aspect that you have. It's just like a constructive thing you can kind of throw it towards. Did you have any part of your psyche or athleticism that lended itself to like w- were you really uh, coordinated did you not did you deal with pain really well like when you got into sort of scraps or things like were you always doing better than others or anything like that um i always had like a liking to it like i never um like would always like you know you and your mates and you know you like you did get in fights and you and your mates like chuck the gloves on and have a bit of fun like i would always um be drawn towards it but i would never i never really took it serious like i remember being like 14 or 15 or seeing the UFC on the TV uh, just like a random Ultimate Fighter episode and there was like two guys lying on the ground and I was like just stand up bro I was like yeah. this sucks like wh- who wants to watch this so I was like so I, I when I finally was 18 and went into a gym um, like I went along with my friend to a gym and, and but I had just had the attention of learning striking I was like yeah I just want to strike like striking is like cool that looks cool you know and then, uh, like, it just happened to be, like, the same day I saw them, some guys were doing jujitsu. I was like, yeah, yeah, all right. Like, I'll jump and give that a go. And you just get wasted. And you're like, well, looks like I have to do this now. Yeah. Like, you know, you get choked out by guys, like, way smaller than you. And you're just like, mm, well, I guess I have to do this now. And I guess that's, like, part like part of martial arts or that I've always had. Like, it's like whoever beats you up the most, you're like, well, I guess I have to hang out with this guy now. <laughs> like, yeah. Was there one moment in particular, and was it working with Carl Weber, was Coach Hostile? Was that your sort of your avenue into into? Not necessarily. So I met uh, Carl, like promoted the show of my first fight, but that's definitely not the reason that I, ca- I walked into a gym. It was actually uh, his name's Steve Warby, is like a former New Zealand like heavyweight champ. That's like the reason I started. I grew up. He was like the toughest guy that we like from our from Mount Ross School, you know, where we grew up. Like, yeah. he's like the toughest, you know, toughest he, guy in the neighborhood. Yeah, he's the <laughs> toughest guy. He still is, you know. I would never say I'm the toughest guy in Mount Ross School because <laughs> Steve Warby's gonna have a problem with you, bro. So, uh, you know, he can have that. He can have that. I'll step that down. Is that like parties? Something bad happens with Steve Cricket. Yeah, Steve. yeah, it'll be like that. You know, <laughs> someone gets beat up down the road. You're just like, oh, get someone go get Steve. You know, like he was like the toughest guy. In the so he was always like the toughest guy and we always looked up to him you know what i mean and then uh he started training in um mma and i went along to his first fight like his first amateur fight this is how it all it all kind of happened and i was like had no idea what mma was had no idea about any of that and i just went along to his first fight and he like knocked this guy's head off in like 13 seconds or something like that like he just threw some punches and dropped the guy and i just remember the feeling of the crowd just going nuts. I remember like looking around at all like our mates and they're all like standing up, just like heads are exploding, being like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I just remember that feeling that everyone had. And I was like, man, like, I don't think I'm capable of that, but I would like to give people that feeling like that's sick. That's like the coolest thing I've ever felt. And then so I just nagged him to take me to the gym. I was like, Steve, take me to the gym. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I arrested him. I was like, take me to the gym, take me to the gym. And then eventually um, that following week, he said like, yeah, all right, like come down this time, be there. Did like one class, got my ass absolutely belted. Did like an MMA session um, with my first coach, John Olsen. And he like dropped me. Like, we did some double legs, and he's like, yeah, all right, we're sparring. I was like, oh, it's like my first day. Like, um, <laughs> He's like, yeah, you'll be all right. I was not all right. Like, he dropped me, like, four or five times of, like, just body shot, and I go down, like, oh. <laughs> you ever been dropped off a body shot? Like, it's the worst feeling in the world. Like, your mind is sharp, but your body just, like, and, like you just get this overwhelming desire to um, go into the fetal, fetal position. position. <laughs> but I remember, like, getting dropped, and him just being like, stand up, stand up. So then I would I would just stand up, you know? And it was like the fourth or fifth time like he dropped me down. And then he I like is still getting up. And he he told me like years later, he's like, When you got up the fifth time, I was like, I might train this kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he's as dumb as he is tough. Like yeah. there might be something here, you know? You mean you mentioned the ultimate fighter and I was trying to think like I consider myself a above average UFC fan. Like I'll watch most of, of the pay per views, I'll watch whatever's on on a Sunday as well. But that Ultimate Fighter, when it was on Sky, was what got me hooked. I remember mm-hmm. it was the season with Roy Nelson. 
the heavyweights. Oh yeah, yeah. When, yeah. when he won it, and then I, this is back in the days of DVDs, by the way. Mm. I remember going down and getting like a DVD of like the greatest UFC knockouts in the history of the UFC, and like it just the, like what you've described that fascination of, like in any moment, something can happen, like it did yeah, yesterday. Yeah. It's but it's polarizing as well, right? Like people love it or hate it. There's other people that just cannot watch it and and don't enjoy it at all. It's, Fair enough. It, it's right. such an interesting thing, though, right? <laughs> like it's it's primal. Oh, one thousand percent. It like it just appeals to like this primal instinct that's in, inside humans that they just like. It's it's the most it's the most exciting sport in the world. Like hands down. Like once you understand the fighters and stuff like that. Um, yeah, without a doubt, like the most exciting sport in the world. Like it's it's just ridiculous. Like what can happen? It's ridiculous that they let us do it. Like if I'm being honest, <laughs> <laughs> there's um that tr- triggered something in me. I remember those DVDs, and there was like huge mismatches, like yeah. these huge big guys against little guys, and it seemed like there was kind of like no rules at one point. That's when it first first started, right? Yeah, yeah. But it, it sort of there's there's a few little key parts of your journey that I want to pick away, and one of them was in 2011 which was under the pride rules, I think, when you fought a heavyweight. Yeah, what, were you yeah. were like, eight, you sort of got to 86 kgs and then you fought someone who was like 120, 130? Have I got that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'd actually fought at, that was like my first fight at featherweight, like two weeks before that fight, which is 66 kilos or 65 kilos. So I'd weighed 65 kilos and then I'd just been like smashing pies. For, in two weeks? Yeah, yeah. And like about... Uh, the fight was in two weeks like that, that fight was like two weeks later but that I wasn't supposed to be in that fight there was like a heavyweight guy at my gym where it was supposed to be like the main event against uh, that bloke his name's is um, Mark Reed he's actually like a very good fighter like we had like, the same belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu like he had like extensive like kickboxing record he's fought for the New Zealand heavyweight MMA title like a couple of times it's not just like a big bloke you know like this guy could bang he, he can fight and uh, he was supposed to be the main event of, like, Pride. It was called Kiwi Pride Rules because there's obviously no elbows allowed in Pride, but obviously Kiwi Pride. So it was, like, soccer kicks, head stomps, like, the works, yeah. like, everything. Yeah. And then uh, I just remember my coach, Aaron, like, coming out back. She's just like, fuck, bullshit. Because the bloke from our gym who was supposed to fight him, like, had, had busted his hand, busted his hand doing something, and he, he actually couldn't do the fight anymore and like, I just see my coach like super upset and I would think it was like my first day back at the gym since my fight at 65 kilos and I was a bit fat but um he goes he's upset and I'm going what's what's the problem here and he's like oh things pulling out he's hurt his hand da, da, da. and I just said oh how much does Blake weigh and he's like oh about 130 I was like Pfft. I'll fight him. <laughs> and I just see the look on Aaron's face. He's like, he's like I said, just 130. Like smile, yeah. Just the smile on his face. Just be like, that'll be cool, you know. Like, <laughs> that'll be cool. And uh, like, that's just what I thought as well. And I just knew like where the sport was, like, uh, I like knew where the sport was going as well. Like, we're just, it's you. I don't think you could get away with that anymore. You know what I mean? So I was like, this will be like, this will be cool. You know, I'd love to fight. A guy like that, I'd love to fight um, someone that's like that much bigger than me and just as experienced. I'd love to just do it, you know, get out there and, and something to prove. Because there's so many people that are just like, oh, you fight at lightweight or you yeah. fight at heavy. I weigh, I weigh 100 kilos. You know what I mean? It's like, man, I can kick your ass. This is talking about the world, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is not like your, your average age. So I kind of had like, that's just uh, like had a little chip on my shoulder as well. Just like, I don't care. Like I can be the best. Like I could be New Zealand heavyweight champ or I could be, you know, the world chant, like it's, it just gets like more and more finite. So I went out there and yeah, it was a war, man. Like I think it's still on YouTube somewhere. Is it? People can find it. It's a, it's a war, man. Like he, um, it was a bit of back and forth. Like I got him down. I remember getting him down, and then like I went to take his back in like the first round because it's like a ten minute first round, like oh, pride rules. Wow. It's a long time. It is a long time. I went to take his back and I had one hook in. I go to throw the other hook in, but he was just too big. Like he was like, so he's like a barrel and I couldn't get my other hook in. And he just like shrugged me like this. And I just went to the bottom. And then like, well, you're having a guy like that on top of you. He's like, starts punching me. And I was just like, all right, I'm going to have to ride this out till the end of the round. But (laughs) it's funny. Like it's funny how like in fighting, like it'll be going well in your head. But then, like, I go back to the corner and my, <laughs> there's a look on my Aaron and Carl's faces and they're just like, 
they were like, is your jaw broken? And I was like, what? Like, is his jaw broken? And I was like, nah, I just can't breathe out my nose. I was like, I have to have my mouth open, like, because my nose had, like, like, we had so much blood coming out of it that it had, like, swollen shut. But, yeah, same thing, like, got him down in the second round, and I finished it with, uh, like, a soccer kick because I came around to take his back again. And I was like, this didn't work so well the first one. So I just went, like, a little bit further, and I just, like, lined up the, like, harder soccer kick I could, and I just remember him, like, looking at me like this, like, <laughs> <laughs> and I just, just booted him in the oh. eye as I was like, God, that hurts your foot too. I was like, ah. <laughs> to, <laughs> credit to him, he stood up. Wow. So I like booted him full force, like in the eye. <laughs> Next thing, like he, he stands up, and I was like, man, I'm just going to unload. And then I just, I was went nuts. I like, started just throwing punches, unloaded. Uh, like he turned away, the ref like waved it off, and I was just. Stoked, but I remember all I wanted to do was eat a Big Mac after that. Fight. I was like, Man, I just want to have a Big Mac. And I went with my like one of my best mates, Bevan. He took me to get a Big Mac, and I got it. And I was like, Ah, Big Mac. I went to bite it, and I was like, Like my jaw, jaw. <laughs> <laughs> I was your jaw like swollen shut. So I had to like rip it into little pieces and like dissolve my Big Mac. I was like, This yeah. sucks. <laughs> yeah. Crowd's gonna be going crazy seeing someone with a sort of 40 kg weight difference. Yeah, oh, wild show, well. wild show. There was like three like different Pride Rules fights that night. Like it was, it was, it was cool, man. It was cool. You could not get away with that yeah, anymore. No, no. Um, I want to connect the dots to UFC in Auckland in 2014. So that was 2011. After that, you'd won five fights in a row in just over a year, I think it was. And you hear that the UFC is coming to Auckland and you want in. You're not on the card, but you want in. So what did you do when that happened? Um... Yeah, like a lot, you have like a lot of different people like, oh, yeah, I've put the word in and I've done this and that. And then they're like, nothing was happening, you know? I was like, nothing's happening. And it was getting to like like five weeks out from like the event. And I was like, this, you know, like everyone's saying they're putting these words in. Like, I don't know what's going on. And then it was uh, Brian Ebersol. He's like, a, uh, I trained with him in Thailand. He'd been a UFC fighter. And he just, he just messaged me. He goes, this is uh, Joe Silver's email. Um, one of the right big matchmakers, right? Yeah, yeah. He was like uh, the matchmaker. He, he like retired soon after I come into the UFC, but um, it was like Joe Silver and Sean Shelby. And he goes, "Oh, this is Joe Silver's Joe, Joe Silver's email. Like, email him." And I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." And I just emailed Joe Silver and I said, "Hey, it's I'm, Hangman at yeah, I just said, <laughs> yeah, I just said like, hey, I'm Dan Hooker. Uh, this is my record. Uh, you're coming. I just said you're coming. You're putting on a show." In my backyard, I said, I'm the best guy we have. I said, you have to put me on the card. And he said, I'll pass you on to Sean Shelby, who did my weight class at the time. And then uh, Sean Shelby just emailed me, just can you make 45, which means that can you make featherweight? I fought there once before. I said, I'd never go back. <laughs> <laughs> I just messaged back, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone else sent me a contract, and that's it. So there's like no big wow. like, but that's like, oh, man, one day I'll go back and I'll – because obviously uh, my coach, like Eugene Pearman and that, like so from now, like going forward, my coach Eugene's like managing me. But up until this point, like I've managed myself. And I just want to, man, I'll show those emails. Like I'll pull them out one day, like between me and Sean Chalby. It's like every fight I've ever been offered is like just a name and a date and then just like sweet. Yeah. <laughs> is it, like is a, it like legit? Like, yeah, yeah, like legit. Genuinely? It's like, <laughs> just like a name and a date. And I'm like, Thanks. Like, it's like one word. <laughs> it's just like one word they must, they must love you in the UFC then. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, the Sean, bro, bro, Sean, like, Sean, like, trips out. Because, like, if you think about how many shows they put on, and obviously they're just, like, signing a local guy to get people there early and stuff like that. Like, how many... The time I've been in the UFC, the, like, thousands of fighters that have been, like, churned through, like, I've seen, like, come and go. Like, I look at all my posters now, and it's like, there's barely any guys on like the 20 UFC posters I have that are still like competing in the UFC from like main event and co-main event. Like the, the turnover in the sport is like ridiculous. So I remember it was like a main event and then I'm at the WAN and like just go up there and shake hands with Sean. And he's just like, man, what a crazy ride like that you've been on to, to, to see you here is like ridiculous. Because you just got assigned as like a local guy and never thought it'd go anywhere. But I just like a bad smell you just can't get yeah. <laughs> you just can't get rid of me because tell me that that first 
contract then, is that a contract just for that event? Like it's not a UFC deal, right? Is it justified on that UFC? No, Auckland no, so how, how they do it is like they, they, your first contract will generally be like a four fight, like okay. a four fight contract, but they can cut you at any time. Like you could lose like your first fight and they can, they can just cut you at any time. But yeah, I, I, it's just been pretty funny. Like the whole process, like I remember having like two fights and then like Sean Shelby's just like, Hey Dan, you want a new contract? And more money, I was like, "Do I ever?" <laughs> <laughs> Just like a kid in a candy store, like I, yeah, very rarely like ask for more money. Like most of the time, it's Sean. Just like, "Hey, it's about time we bump you up," and I'm like, "Really? That's great." <laughs> um, so that 2014 is that one of those moments you talk about that you've fought for yourself to get on this card and you win it? I'm assuming all of your friends and family and people that have helped you get to that point are there. Is that is that a standout moment? Yeah, for sure, and it's like something you don't, uh, you doesn't sink in, or you don't realize till like so much, so much later. It's just like because it keeps coming back and it keeps hanging, hanging around, and people keep bringing it up. I guess that's what it is because, to me, there's so much like more, uh, there's so much more I have left to do, in the sport. Like you're just focused on on what you're doing and moving forward and and staying, um, staying on the path really. But yeah, that definitely is one of the bigger moments like all of all three of the the um ufc events here in new zealand at home i've been so lucky with like the results of those and and with the kind of fights that they are they've been so good like to get the knockout in the first um two fo uh ufc events are here and then just the war with paul fowler was like just the just like the perfect situation for it to come down the way that it came down was just um yeah, they're all all three of those are pretty incredible moments. When you're when you're a Kiwi coming onto those cards at the early stage, are guys like Mark Hunt and that are they giving you advice on on what to do, or is it still quite solitary in terms of how you how you approach them? Yeah, it is pretty solitary. Like, um, I just remember uh, like Jamie Tahuna was the first Kiwi that like got signed to the UFC, and then when he got signed, I was just like, what? Like it was like a moment like that. Maybe I was like we can get in the UFC. I, was yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know it was possible because there no one from New Zealand had, or oh, born in New Zealand had ever been in the UFC. So that was like crazy. And then you saw more guys, um, Mark Hunt, Dylan and Andrews, and you were just like, man, this, this might actually be like a, like a possibility. But then you, yeah, everyone's, everyone's like figuring it out. You know what I mean? Like everyone plays it, everyone plays it differently. So yeah, they, it's not like they, really reach out and offer you like yeah it's kind of just you got to figure it out you got to figure it out for yourself that's that's just um the thing that i can say is just now like going forward obviously with like guys like eugene my coach eugene beerman and and that being said like those are the people that are gonna give you that advice like those are the people that are gonna like if you show up at city kickboxing and you're a great fighter and like he will steer you in the right direction like there is like there's like a set path on how to do it now like it's not it's not this big mystery like it was when i was coming up it was just a mystery it was just like man you, you just had to figure it out for yourself bro like have have fun um but now it's now there's like a set path on on how to do it i want to um continue the journey so to into 2018 so you've won four fights in a row all within three minutes and you get matched up with Edson Barboza, who's a total weapon. And this was a jaw-dropping display of mental toughness. I was watching me and Shay sort of exchanging clips, and this was one we watched last night. And it's your body gave out before your mind. And I was really interested in some of the comments I've heard you make about this fight afterwards. And you said that you knew at a certain stage you couldn't win, but you refused to stop, and you knew that you're... you're sort of corner guy made the right move by not getting involved but you would say like the guys you coach your advice would be sort of to to stop to, to throw the flag in sort of thing i was just wondering reflecting on that if, if that's accurate and, and please go into as much or as little detail as you want but if that's accurate like how do you reflect on that now <coughs> um yeah like that's a funny one that's just like uh yeah Carl, Carl was like on the money. That's that. Like Carl obviously has like my best interest at heart. Like he's an incredibly experienced corner man. Like I, I thank him for not telling that. I thank him for for letting it play out the way that it played out. 
yeah it is it is different as a coach like i definitely don't coach like a fight like, <laughs> like i'm there to i i feel like i know these guys because i see them every every week in the gym i know what they're capable of and i don't feel i don't feel like i need to i i know i already know so i don't have to like push them to that point or let them go but it's just yeah me and carl uh like he's my coach but he's also like he knows me and he's my friend and he's like man i just i just knew i couldn't like i just he because carl obviously knows me as a person like he knows where i've come from like he knows why i fight like he knows everything about me so that's the reason why he didn't stop that fight because it, that would have that fight sits right with me now like i'm all right with that fight i'm cool with that fight if he would have had stopped that fight maybe I'll, i don't think it, i don't think i could live with that that would eat away at me a little bit um that we didn't that we didn't let it play out so yeah like i don't i don't have like any regrets about that performance but obviously obviously there's like not every like training is is um like perfect you know what i mean like there's always you're always going to have an excuse that's like the funny thing about um combat sports and the results that you get but you just the fastest way to move through it is just like own it like put it on yourself like and just own own like i'm the reason that i lost it's, it's decisions that i made that led me to lose but i'm happy with that as long as it's on me like i'm i'm cool with it i feel like a lot of fighters try to put it on other people like they're like oh the this guy or my coach or uh this happened in training or when i warmed up i, I wasn't wearing the right undies like that's why i lost like and i feel like that just takes you you just don't improve you just don't improve because you don't own those losses you don't take responsibility for it yourself which just really just slows your growth and progress as a fighter you, you know the sport <laughs> Is there any middle ground in combat sports? Do you know what I mean? Like, it sounds like it's high highs and, and kind of low lows. No, nah, no, like, no. There's no middle ground. Right. There's, it's there's right. No, right. There's no middle ground. No, no. <laughs> like no I, it's, a, it's, it's a roller coaster, man. Like, uh, yeah, the highest of highs. And, and that's why they say, you know, the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Because that's that's truly what it is. Like, you, ha you have to celebrate the wins. You have to enjoy those moments because really that's why you do it is, is for the wins and enjoying those moments of, of why you work because no matter, you know, if, if you don't enjoy the wins, trust me, like the agony of defeat is still kicks your ass. Like that, that mm. <laughs> that's still there. There's no, there's absolutely no balancing the sport out. But that, that psyche, back to Barboza, <laughs> is why you're one of the best fighters in the world right like it's it's really difficult to watch but i've seen you talk about your legs gave out like you couldn't use your legs anymore so all you had was you're striking against someone who you knew was going to beat you but you're not throwing it in you're you're fighting for it you're staying in and you're just going to see at the course which good or bad wrong or right like that is incredible steely resolve which not many people in the world have right well, i don't know I don't know like i only know myself <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you don't know how you don't know how other people think but it's just like it's just deals you have with yourself like i as long as i don't give up on myself like that's the true reason why i've got so far in the sport is that i've never i've never doubt myself and i never give up on myself and i fully support myself so even though it's there and i knew like obviously the fight was not like over obviously i got like a uh a snowflakes chance in hell you know of, of <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. pulling something out yeah. of my ass you know what i mean like as as to why i would keep on going but yeah it's just you can't quit on yourself because that that truly that truly eats away at me that truly eats away at me if i had like I, like i'm saying like i could have stopped that fight i could have stopped that fight and saved face but i would have known like when the doctor comes to the corner and like my vision because he um broke my orbital with like an elbow it actually broke my orbital so like when you break your orbital like your vision like kind of goes and and i remember like being cut and just the the blood was blocking that eye and the doctor comes in to like check and they're holding up fingers and i'm getting it wrong and stuff like you can just you can literally like when the doctor comes to check like hold up the fingers like say the wrong number you know what i mean like the doctor is very good like he leans in and he asks you like man do you still you still want to fight and all you have to do is like say nothing like and i could have stopped that fight i could have i and and save face and no one would have known any different 
the crowd watching at home would have just been like, oh, the doctor stopped the fight. Oh, that's, you know, oh, that sucks. Move on. But I would have known within myself that I quit, that I look for a way out. And I wouldn't fight because obviously if I'm looking for a way out, I'm not even going to step inside of that cage ever again. But I didn't. Like, I just didn't look for a way out. Like, he, he stopped me fair and square. And I'm, I'm happy with that. We shake hands at the end. I tip my hat. You're the better man on the night. Congratulations. We move on to the next one. That's why that's the beauty of the sport. It's just money, money. It's just man versus man, wool versus wool. It's fear. It's even. And if you lose, you lose. It's not the end of the world. We get, you live to fight another day. And you bounce back. You won the next three fights after that. I mean, pulling yourself back from that to rebuild like that is impressive as well. Yeah, that's just like what you know that you're capable of. Like I know, I know what I'm capable. Um, like I've always said that the goal is to be is to have the belt the goal is to be the like regardless of how few people like truly believe in you like <laughs> yeah. like I know what I'm capable of and that's all I need I don't need anyone else to say oh yeah I think you can do that like that's not where I draw my confidence from like my confidence from is is from within because people are always gonna say things and doubt you and say you can't do things like you can't let that sort of thing affect you steven and i come from team like a team sports background and the wins that you talk about when you celebrate your wins we get to go into the dressing room share the moment with like our teammates or coaches or staff a lot of the times after fights you end up in a private hospital right like and that's not Exact like that's not an exaggeration. That's, that's definitely not an exaggeration. That's like that's, that's <laughs> like a thing, right? And like you win. Like a lot of times, I like I've won, and you just like, like UFC Auckland people. Man, you must have had a good party. It's like, nah, I was in the hospital. Like <laughs> all my mates were at the after party, and I was like sitting in it. Like, oh, you're happy days. You're happy days though. But like the, the the Dustin Poirier fight, like that you've both ended up there. You've both given everything you can, and then you kind of share. Like, do you share a moment? afterwards kind of together in the hospital is that kind of how that story with, goes with, yeah without a doubt there's always like um things that go on behind the scenes where you see them yeah like paul felder me and him they wheeled us in together um does poor the same thing like we both went to the hospital and then we we're in like um like beds next to each other and because i remember like after he didn't say anything like i was obviously like calling him out saying i'm gonna smash your face and <laughs> and stuff like that and then after the fight like i knew i had lost two like two rounds to three like i knew i i knew i had lost and with there being like no crowd there because it was at the apex like i just i just i if there was a crowd there i would have probably acted tough a little longer but i was like i was just gutted about losing so i sat down and then he hadn't said anything until that moment and then he like walks over to like the middle of the ring and he's like yeah smash smash my face and smash and i just remember sitting there hearing him and just going now he wants to talk <laughs> shit. I was like, now he wants to get in my face. I was like, all right. Like, stood up. We got like four to four. And I was like, let's go. I was like, round six, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like, uh, it's like a level of mutual respect. And then he was like, obviously just fired up from the fight and had his adrenaline going. And then we're like at the hospital in the beds next to each other. And he's just going, yeah, you know, I just, you know, about the things that you said. And I was just like, brother, I'm just confident on myself. Like, it's got absolutely nothing to do with you. That was just to get the fight. You know, I was, yeah, you just like stand your ground. Like, I stick by, I stick by, every, you, yeah. Uh, you got to stick by everything you say. You got to, you got to, you got to eat your words. It's not like a team, it's not like a team sport. Like, when you win, you, you all win together. Um, but when when you win an MMA, you get all of the mm. accolades. But it's the same thing as when you lose. It's not like you lose as a team. You're like ah, pen each other. It's all right, boys. So we'll, be, we'll, we'll get it back next week. It's not like that. Like all the lights are, are pointed at you, and everyone's pointing their finger at you, being like ah, you lost. Like so, that's that thrill and ag agony. You you take it all on the chin, but you get all of the accolades. So there's there's give and take. Is, is there such thing as a good loss? Because that fight, it seemed like your star, despite losing, grew because of the incredible display you put on. Like, you're so close to beating him. It just the like, fight of the year. It was just an absolute war of attrition. Like, was is that the best way to lose a fight? Um, That's, like, other people's reaction. 
which was like funny to me. Like that's why I like sat down and I was like, oh man, I lost because to to like to me losing is losing. Like <laughs> whether you knock me out in the first second of the first round or whether we do a fight like that, I still lost. Like losing is losing to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's that's just other people's reaction to the fight, which is not doesn't um that like doesn't truly ref- reflect like my own feelings about the fight like to me to me winning's winning and losing's losing like that that to me is is like uh yeah that's like a smudge that's a smudge like that's that's a loss that's a loss you have to you have to take that he he beat me that night and that's something you have to accept i'm re- i'm reflecting on what you're saying as you're saying it and it's combat sports is one of those ones it's a little bit like formula 1 where the viewer, the casual viewer, will never ever experience the actual sport. I'm never going to get behind the wheel of a Formula One car. I'm never going to get in the, into an octagon. I love it regardless. And like you say, we as fans kind of have no idea what you're going through as an athlete in terms of we we put a lens on a, like a gallant defeat for want of a better word, or like you just get pipped at the at the finish line. But it's yeah, it's such an odd sport that you don't really know you i have no idea no idea what you no <laughs> idea what you're thinking like and, and when, as you're explaining it i'm just listening to it going fuck yeah like it's a bizarre kind of thing to try and rationalize a thousand i 1000 percent agree with you it's a it's a yeah it's a it's a ridiculous sport it's like it's such it's such high stakes like you you're genuinely going out there and putting your life on the line that's like formula one those guys race a million miles an hour like one one mistake on a corner and they they flip and kill themselves like it, it's 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 truly you're going out there and, and putting your life on the line i, I want to pick up on what you said before about eugene taking over the sort of management side because i've heard you talk about perhaps one of your weaknesses is your impulsiveness or your recklessness to just accept fights so if a fight gets put in front of you you say yes you're never going to back down you're never you're just always going to accept it and in these last i don't know last couple of years did that get to a point where you realized that actually i can't keep doing this myself i'm going to need eugene to take care of me or how did that sort of play out yeah i guess it's the saying um if you want to move fast go alone if you want to go far you know you, you take people with you that's that's just the kind of situation so there's like pros and cons to everything because obviously like Eugene with the success of city kickboxing and stuff like that. But I've been in the UFC for like since 2014. I've been um, in the UFC like a very long time since all of that team had kind of, is at the stage like where it is now. Um, so I've been able to like sit back and see it grow. And it's been incredible what, you know, they've been able to accomplish with multiple world titles and, you know, Kai coming that close and having so many UFC fighters from the same gym in such a small part of the world so i've yeah i've been in the ufc like the whole time that that was happening so i've been able to see the kind of growth of that and i've it, it's a funny sport because yeah there's like a aspect of you that has to be like incredibly selfish we just have to look out for yourself you know what i mean um that's that's like the balance that i had to come to this stage to find that balance because you have to be so selfish, like you have to be selfish with your time, like miss people's birthdays to train or miss people's, um, you know, people will die and you'll be overseas like and you can't come back because you're away fighting. Like there's very difficult things that you have to be very selfish about with the sport. Um, but yeah, it's just come to this point and it's just life experience. Um, and it's come to this point where I'm like, man, I need my coaches. I need my team. I need these people. And I need to invest in them the same way that they have um, invested their time in me. But it's only it's only like through experience that you can come to that point. That's like the and it's um, yeah. I'm just honest with myself, uh, honest enough with myself that I can truly like realize like it was it was my fault. You know what I mean? <laughs> I I'd, I'd push him all away or not push him all away, but you know I got these offers like hey, you want to fight Michael Chandler in Dubai? And I said, yeah. And then I knew, like, none of my coaches could, like, come. And it's just, like, that bullheadedness just being like, ah, I can do it without my coaches. No, you can't, you know what I mean? Like, it's, like, from going out there um, 
same thing like with the Islam fight. Like, oh man, you want to fight Islam Makachev? Uh, you're not going to be able to go home and train with your team. Ah, I can do it without my. No, you can't. You know what I mean? It's just through experience um, that you just have to be honest with yourself and truly realize, like, man, I need, I need my team, I need my coaches, I need these people, and I need to, um, yeah, I need to invest in them the same way they invest in me. The good thing is, it seems like the age of fighters seems to be extending. Like your early thirties, right, thirty two, thirty three. Like you could be fighting for another ten years if mm. and using this experience, these things that these mistakes you made. Now you know you need a team. Like that's the that's that. the funny thing about you. Like in any other professional sport, like a forty year old is ancient. But we, you know, we Glover Teixeira is a like a forty one year old UFC champion. Like we have that. There was uh. Was it like Randy Couture, damn near fifty, like still competing at the highest level of the sport? It's it's because of that level of experience, because there's so many different disciplines and so many aspects of, of mixed martial arts that you have to understand, and so much learning that it's that balance of experience with like that youthful athleticism. It's like if you're like an NFL player, that youthful athleticism is like ninety percent. <laughs> yeah, of like the yeah, requirement the, yeah, the, the, yeah, it's, 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 it's it's so much more so like their time um, is a lot shorter than like combat sports but yeah like 20 more years jujitsu experience that's gonna pay dividends down the track you know 20 more years wrestling and striking and like that that level of knowledge makes like a, a huge difference um, in, in mixed martial arts and that's why it leads to like just fighters having having so much more longevity in our sport and you see guys like fighting like um like uh and and as well like you don't really get that man strength until you're like 30 like mid 30s where you that, that just, dad strength that yeah. dad strength <laughs> 40, you know, 40 i think you know, like, cuz i i started fighting professionally when i was a teenager like i was 19 and had my first professional fight against a guy like in his 30s and you yeah you weigh the same weight and you look good and stuff like that but like if me now same way, like grabbed a hold of that kid, like done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a I'm a grown man now. Like I gotta squeeze that kid to death. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> it's just different. Yeah, but you're also having some time off at the moment, right? Like I think I've heard you say that it's the first time you've really had an off season because you're mm -hmm. always either fighting and recovering or planning for the next fight, and you've been inactive for a little while now. But I, I did see an Instagram post the other day sort of teasing yesterday. that... Yesterday? Yesterday? Yeah, yesterday? yeah, yeah teasing yeah, yeah, that yeah. something yeah. might be on the horizon. But has it been great having time? Like, how has it been having this off-season? Oh, just like his... Yeah, it's like the first time I've actually had a break since I've um, been in the US. And it, it can sometimes the answer can be like that simple. Like Eugene's like, bro, you just need to just have some time <laughs> you just need to like have a bit of holiday and relax for a bit and it, it did like it completely like reignite uh that fire that you have in you like you're just like man like i've been harassing him for months like bro i need a fight like get me a fight get me a fight and he's been like holding it out as as long as he could but man i just um that fire is just steaming like i just want to get back in there and want to want to want to prove something you know what i mean like i feel like the time for talking is done i feel like a time to get out there and actually um yeah time for talking is done like let, let's show them you know let's let's got a chip on my shoulder let's let's show them we, we've referenced them a few times but eugene we've had on the podcast so if you're a fight fan i suggest you go back and listen to that previous episode he said one thing right at the end which really resonated with both Stephen and i it's that kids now like when we were growing up kids wanted to grow up and be all blacks like kids now are growing up and wanting to be UFC fighters, which is amazing. Are you conscious that the stuff that you're doing is influencing like a generation of kids, like future athletes coming forward? Do you stop and think about that or you just go about your business? Yeah. This is the, the, the viewership of the sport is like been incredible and there's a like growth, but there is a, there is like a select few people that are like genuinely um, built for the sport, and I don't think that will. will the, yeah, like you'll never see. You'll never see. Like, like everyone wants to fight because obviously, like I run my own gym. Like everyone wants to fight, yeah. but no one wants to actually do the work, or no one's like actually like about it. About it, like that. That 
kind of person that gets out there and dedicates their life to this and is just like, man, I want to fight. Like, that has never increased. Like, there's obviously more people doing jujitsu and more people doing kickboxing, more people in getting involved in the sport, but the people that are just actually built for combat is like, that's never going to increase. Like, there's a special, it's a, it takes like a special kind of person to truly be built for like dedicating your life to it. And I mean, like, a lifetime like fighter and that's like when you come down to city kickboxing and you you meet some of those guys that are just you know had 40 50 60 fights and you're just like no nah, these guys are built different to like <laughs> these guys are built different you know like they're not yeah you're obviously going to be everyone's walking in the gym these days being like yeah i'm going to be israel or it's like that's a one in a billion like <laughs> Well, that's a one in seven billion. Like that's a, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a very small success story. It's a good point, and it is more accessible though. I've got a five-year-old, and there's like an MMA core sort of workshop down the road from us that we're looking. Oh shit, should we get him into MMA next year? It's something that wouldn't have even been on the cards five years ago, mm. ten years ago. Like it, it is becoming an option for middle-class parents like myself. <laughs> um, but one of the things I also heard you say, and you talk about being built different, is that you don't get nervous and it's something that you don't want your um the people you train to feel because you feel like nerves are good but for for whatever reason you don't feel nerves is that right nah like i i yeah because everyone gets nervous but yeah like i have to make myself nervous because because obviously like nerves are, nerves are so um essential for performance like they're so essential for you performing well like because I've gone out to fights and just like you get like a round in and you're losing and get beat up and you're like, that's right, you're in a fight. <laughs> you're like you have to. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know. I actually can't put it down to anything. I don't know why I'm so okay with um, like that side of the sport that it just really doesn't spark adrenaline. Like I have to go out, sit out back and be like, all right, Dan, come on. <laughs> it's like. 50 million people watching yeah. this. Like, <laughs> yeah. I have to this really, yeah, yeah. I have to like really like G myself up for it because yeah, it just comes, I guess it's just, this is where I want to be. Like I feel so comfortable inside of the cage. I feel so comfortable um, in that like high pressure environment. Like it's really the sport for me. Like it's yeah. really, it's really nothing else. Um, there's really nothing else that I would rather be doing like then fighting someone in a cage like it seems like a very strange thing to say but it's just the honest truth yeah it certainly sounds like you're made for it um i want to sort of go backstage ufc and i know shay's got a lot of questions on this as well but as you're coming up and you're part of the ufc is there are there any sort of fanboy moments where you're you're meeting people or you're interacting with guys that you've grown up watching or you've been really sort of awestruck by yeah like um I remember, like, there's only one guy, I think there's only, like, one guy I've ever, like, asked for a picture. And I was, like, getting my, like, Reebok kit. It was, like, the first time that Reebok was out. And um, Alexander Gustafson was fighting DC for the for the title in um, Houston. I just remember getting my Reebok kit and, like, looking and just looking up. And I was, like, Gustafson. And because uh, John Jones Gustafson is, like, my favorite fight of all time. So I've watched that fight, like, 50 times. I've just been, like can I get a picture? <laughs> like straight away, it was just like, man, I need to get a picture with this guy. Like I'm starstruck. So yeah, you like, you definitely do. And that's why when like people come up to me and they ask for pictures, um, like I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to oblige. Cause I've, I've ha felt that feeling where you don't even think about it. You know, you're not even just yeah. like, Oh man, should I, shouldn't I? Like yeah. I was just turned to him and I was like, I need a picture with you. <laughs> and he, he, he obliged and, and did it with me. So that's why I would never um, like turn anyone down for a picture or be like too cool for it. You know, even when you're not feeling in like the best mood, you're just like, yeah, because I've been, I've had that feeling of being that guy and just being like, oh, I need a picture with yeah, <laughs> this guy. Yeah. What about guys in your division? I guess you can't, I, I guess you're at a point now where it's not like you're going to be fans of, of others, but, but guys like Conor McGregor, you know the the biggest names. I, Izzy was on a podcast with Joe Rogan, and he's kind of like singing your praises on these huge scales to, to tens of millions of people. Like, are, there, are there interactions like that 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 make you smile? Um, nah. Like, I don't really get. I don't really like get caught up in any like that side of it. You know what I mean? Um, nah. Now they're like all people. Like everyone. Everyone's just like a person. Everyone has good days, bad days. 
Uh, and that's like regardless of who it is. Like you meet Dana White and she goes, out. like he's he's just a person. He's just a guy. Like you're you're to uh, saying I have is like you're as famous as you think you are. Like that, <laughs> that's just it. You know, if you're the most famous guy in your street, you're the most famous guy in the world. If you never leave your street, you know what I mean. Like <laughs> you're just that's good. Um, you're you you're as famous as you think you are. Like I just. Yeah, you can't get you get so you can't get caught up in all of that stuff. Like everyone, everyone's human. Everyone has their wins. Everyone has their losses. There's no, I don't put. I don't think. Um, I don't think I'm better than anyone. Like I don't walk around thinking like, oh, I'm cooler than anyone. But that you can't have that belief. You can't have that belief of not thinking you're not better than anyone, and then thinking people are better than you. Like no one. You know, no one shit smells like roses. <laughs> like everyone, everyone's human. So it's just I use that when like I meet people and I and I fight these guys that are the biggest names in the world. Like he he gets tired too. Like he bleeds. He has bad days. Like um, he gets sick. He if I hit him in the chin hard enough, like he'll fall over. Uh, I'm sure of it. Um, one of the things that always fascinates me is the post fight interviews. Like, do you have that clarity of thought? Nah, I fired <laughs> up, man. <laughs> but, you know, but you know what I mean? Like, what? Like you had a result, and then Daniel Cormier or Joe Rogan puts a microphone and asks you a question. Do you actually hear the question, or are you just saying whatever? Nah, it depends. Like now, I'm at the point now where you can like stay. Like I have like a general idea, and everyone that see my post one is just know. Because you're really articulate, like really, really. I good. use my my post fight interviewers to get me another fight. Like that's <laughs> that's all I have yeah. in my head. So I have like a general idea of like someone that makes sense for me fighting, or like you call out like the best case scenario that you could possibly get. Because why not? You know what I mean? Like you chuck the microphone, everyone's looking at you. You may as well like you may as well shoot your shot. You know what I mean? So that's like a general idea I have in my head. But yeah, I can generally stay like pretty cool and calm. Um, but yeah, you see, that you I never get like give anyone shit for for doing some fiery ass stuff. You know what I mean? Because you just you just don't know that feeling like that. You know when you knock someone out and the crowd goes nuts and you're running around and you've changed your life and you know you're gonna get a bonus and like yeah. there's there's some that's some wild adrenaline yeah. there, there, and there's no drug in the world that can compare to anything like that feeling. You know what I mean? So I see it funny when there's like younger guys, you know, and they chuck the microphone and they're like, oh, I'll fight the incredible hole. <laughs> like they just say some wild <laughs> shit. That was on that clip with the, the Izzy put together, the frenemies one. And the emotion from when you're watching him win too and when yeah, he's watching yeah, you yeah. win, it's not just when, you, when you're seeing someone else yeah. and you know how hard they've worked and you, that, that's adrenaline for you too, right? Oh, a thousand percent, thousand percent. Like I never get, um, yeah, like, I don't get nervous for my own fights, but I get like very nervous for like when my friends fight, like when a couple of weeks ago we had like Blood Diamond and um, Kai fighting and I'm the whole day, like can't sleep the night really? before, like I'm pacing backwards and forwards, like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Like it's funny, like I don't get nervous at all because it's like that level of control which gives you the calm. Like it's me out there, obviously um, panicking and getting stressed about it and getting tight and getting worried. Like it's not going to help you. So I don't. Like I'm in control of the situation. Is why I don't get nervous. It's like when they are over there, it's like less nerves when I uh, was like cornering Kai for the Cody Garbrandt fight because obviously like you're cornering him, you can yell shit out. Yeah. <laughs> you have like some level of control over the fight. So then I'm not nervous. Like uh, then I'm less nervous. But then it's like when you're at home in New Zealand and they're in America and you're just like sitting there watching the TV, you have absolutely no control on the outcome of the fight. And I feel like that's where the nerves come from. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's like a level of control calms you. Yeah. So, so 30 minutes before a fight, when you're not nervous and you're in the dressing room, changing room, what are you doing? Like, Are you listening to music? Yeah, are you just sitting yeah. by yourself? Are you, are you, sort of no, you just out? You just go there... Um, with the team, like, you might get, like, drug tested or something like that. You're just, like, sitting in the changing room and you're just, like, oh, just, like, kind of people watching. That's, like, the funnest part. You'll be, like... Because they're shared, they're shared warm-up depends areas, Depends on, right? like, where you go. <laughs> depends on where you go. Like, it's just kind of random. Like, they'll ask you at the start of the week, uh, like, oh, is there anyone you don't want to be in the okay. changing room with? So, like, generally it's not, like, a, like a 
conflictual environment like with someone that you might fight in your next fight or something like that so but i just like people watching because you obviously get to see how like other teams warm up and like how other fighters like get g'd up for their fights so it's kind of cool have you seen anything crazy from another fighter in terms of getting themselves fired up um like some teams like are very rudimentary and they're like you'll see that you're like basic shit you know like they'll just be like oh so like they'll be like teaching a guy an armbar and you're like bro this is way too late <laughs> you know I mean? but i've had some funny ones like i think i was in houston when uh like Derek laws made like his ufc debut and shit and he was just like cowboy bro like didn't <laughs> he was just a cowboy like he just was like yeah bro like go throw some bombs like let's see and I, was like, I was like sitting there going like this guy and then he came back and like had obliterated his opponent he's an like, amazing oh, character right? yeah amazing. but he's just a he's just a fighter like like we're saying like there's just some people that this this is for like this this is like the most constructive thing Derek Laws could possibly be doing with his time. Like there's, there's no and his post match. Ama- his post match oh, is amazing. I love it when he wins. Yeah. I love it when he wins. Oh, I'm gonna shit myself. Yeah, like he just, <laughs> he's too good. You know what I mean? But yeah, there's always like funny. There's always funny stuff you see out back. But yeah, you're just like hanging out with the team, like, and you just like warm up. But that like you're just kind of going through the the process. Like we do that every week twice a day seven days a week though you do that 14 times a week you know like that that process of of getting ready so that's you're just going through the motions by that point what do you miss um when when eugene's there like so the, the fight you lost and you said you went without your coaching staff i'm assuming that was without eugene what does he add to fight day not that you need that calming presence but what, what does he offer in the background uh yeah it's just like uh like genuine advice that can that can um like you're having your your corners for like you you put people in there that can have like an impact on the fight because it's cornering is like such a it's such like a hard thing to master because there's so many variables like and you and you only get like a short space and time like and some fighters can completely not listen and you ha- you you genuinely and, and I learned this from, like from coaching you have to you have to understand your athlete you have to understand your fighter you have to understand why they walked in the gym in the first place you have to understand um where they are mentally and physically at that exact point in time you know what i mean cuz so much can happen behind the scenes like you know you, there's fighters you know you, you need to know like oh shit if misses left him a week ago mm-hmm. You need to know his kid's sick or you need to know oh, he hasn't slept because someone's passed away. He hasn't slept in five days. So you need to understand like the thought process of your fighter and then that will definitely impact like the information you give them, whether it's going to be long, whether it's going to be short, whether it's going to be like you need to know how they tick to get them. So it's just having that level of experience. Like my coaches like Twist and um, Andre and Huge mike and doug like they 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 know me you know what i mean like they see me um every single day multiple times a day like they know what makes me tick they know how to get me fired up they know the instructions that i'm gonna listen to so it's like an incredibly complex thing but it's just someone that knows you and knows your path inside and out and they know how to trigger some kind of response in you but what's the best message to get to you in between rounds but it's gonna change like it's gonna change like we got like it's infinite you know and it only comes from like that huge wealth of experience that he has in coaching huge wealth of experience he has from competing himself and working with guys like lolo like working with some of the best coaches in the world himself and having such uh, spent so much time um learning and having a huge understanding of the sport that he can adapt to regardless of the situation like um is yeah it, it changes man it can yeah. you don't know how that you might go out and get dropped first punch like come back you're exhausted like what do you say <laughs> but, but <laughs> only, is, yeah. yeah is his delivery always that kind of behind the hand <laughs> quite quite like that's is it quite his qu- um that's his uh and i kind of i i understand that like badass, that's that's man. um that's his like thing is that they so they mic up like whoever's like the main cornerman in the ufc like they're just like they walk out back and the same as Kai's fight. They're like, who do we mic up? 
And I was just like pointed at Jordy, the nutritionist. I was like, yeah, yeah, he's the coach. And they were like, are you guys sure? Like, yeah, Mike up Jordy. Yeah, 300 grams of protein. Like, it's, like what's he going to say? You know what I mean? Uh, because like, I believe what like Eugene believes and that's that's a private moment between like you and your fighter like the world doesn't need to hear that because sometimes it can be incredibly personal because you know all of that stuff because you know what's going on in their life you know how to motivate them you know how they think um so that's an incredibly like private moment and something he might say you know you might not want the world um hearing and analyzing like you saying like man think about like do it for your children or like, yeah it might be something very personal that that and I know it's like a entertainment sport and stuff like that, but there's like aspects of this that is like incredibly, um, yeah, it's like incredibly personal going out there. So you know, Eugene's belief is that's a, that's a private moment, that's a personal moment between you and your fighter. That's yeah. that yeah, the only people that should hear that is is you and him. That's cool. Uh, any more behind the scenes uh, UFC stuff, Shane? I just wondered, does a like does a press conference with Conor McGregor, ch- the dynamic change? Ever so slightly, or oh, not, bro, not? They hide him. They hide him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They whisk him out of nowhere. Like they have a secret <laughs> back room. Like no one else gets gets treated like that. Like I fought with like the biggest names um, on like big cards and stuff like that. But yeah, he's he gets he gets the special special. Uh, have, have you been in one of those ones? You have been in one of those ones where he's yeah, there yeah, as well yeah, on the mic yeah, as well. Like. Yeah. He, are you are those pinch yourself moments as well? Where you're kind of like, "Fuck, I just want to see how this plays out." Because, <laughs> like you said, those yeah, mo- I those thought that moments. was going to be a good one, but I thought that was going to be a good one. So that was uh, he was fighting Dustin Poirier. That was like the Chandler one in Dubai, and I was like, obviously, I'm like a fan of the sport as well. I like the shitstorm Conor McGregor <laughs> brings as much as anyone else, and I was like, that's going to be good. <laughs> And then I get there, I'm sitting there, and then they were like, it was like the most respectful press conferences. And we're like, yeah, I think he's really great. And then Poirier's going, I'm just thinking they're going, stink. I'm going, this is stink. I was like, fight. I was like, argue. Let's have some fun. I was like, that's what the people are watching. I was like, this is stink. Because the weigh-in as well is a, it's a fascinating, like it's a, it's a, yeah. Uh, have you ever gone into a weigh-in and, weigh-in and like with a deliberate ploy to really throw your opponent off. Nah, like crazy? My, my opinion is like you're you're gonna get whatever you want to get out of the way in. You know what I mean? And you see it with like so many guys. Like you come back and like yeah, I stared him in his eyes and oh man, I saw him break. I saw him. I saw he doesn't want to be there. But like the guy's just thinking about his lunch or something. You know what I mean? Like you're gonna what whatever you want to get. Like if you want to get confidence from the way in, like you're gonna get confidence from the way in if you like convince yourself there's a reason to be confident like oh he looked away first like oh, i've got this fight in the bag like every fight every fighter is um different but yeah it wasn't until i fought um jim miller but until i realized like yeah none of that shit even matters bro like because jim miller is like the most ufc fights um in in history like the guys had the most fights and I've watched Jim Miller since I first started watching the sport, and he's just an absolute weapon, bro. Like, he comes out, and he's just storming back and forth. Like, he just comes out like a bat out of hell. Um, so I was like, man, looking. And then we did, like, a press conference, and I just looked at him, and he's like... And I get to the way, and I was like, all right, he's going to come out now, you know? Like, this will be it. And we're, like, staring face to face, and he's looking at me like this. Like, <laughs> like he's not even thinking. I was like, where's Jim Miller? Like, this <laughs> I was like, where's he gone? Now getting the fight, like I walk first. I was like in the octagon, like waiting, like oh, yeah, all right, all right. And then I saw him just hear his music, and I just see him storming down. <laughs> he's just storming down, gets in the ring, and he's just like gets in the ring in the cage, and he's just like pacing back and forth, just, just like death staring me, bro. Able to switch, and he's on. And I was like. <laughs> I just remember thinking in my head, I go, there he is. I was like, that's him. I was like, that's the Jim Miller that I want to fight. I was like, I don't want to fight way in Jim Miller. I don't want to fight press conference Jim Miller. I want to fight that guy right there that's bringing the heat. Um, So that was like it for me. I was just like, it's a waste. Like, this is the guy with the most UFC experience in history. All of it's bullshit. All the wham and this and that, like, it's all bullshit. Like, just get out of there. It's just a fight. That's, a, that's the only part that matters. The, the whole weight cut side of things, is it true the UFC, it, like, provides you with a nutritional plan in order to drop the weight really quickly? Have, have I got that wrong? 
Can, uh, I, can, nah, I, get, they, can they, I get my hands on that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it comes back on pretty quick. Yeah, it's the part they don't tell you. Um, yeah, so now, like, well, since I've been in the UFC, like, they, they didn't used to. Like, they didn't used to do, like, um, weight cuts and stuff like that. Um, but now they do. Like, they have specialized, like, uh, like weight cutting professionals, um, Clint and Charles. And, yeah, I know these guys, like, quite well. Uh, we have our own nutritionist, Geordie, a fight dietitian, who works with them. It works pretty closely with them, but yeah, like they provide all your meals for five week and stuff like that. Like it's uh, it's like an uh, yeah, it's like an incredible service. It's like the dumbest part of the sport. Like it's so stupid, but what do you do? You know what I mean? You just be like, yeah, I'm not gonna cut weight, and then just like fight someone bigger than you. Like that's then you lose. Like <laughs> yeah, what's it's the, such a significant like advantage. What What's the most amount of weight you're comfortable cutting? Um. Like ninety ninety five percent of it is done like through your training camp, like and that's just dropping like body fat and stuff like that. Like it's only like fight week, like you're only cutting out like carbohydrates and sodium and stuff like that, which is not that hard on your body. Um, yeah, the water cut is like just like a five percent or or like a small percentage of stuff that's just gonna bring off like the last couple of kilos. To, to make it there is that the most disrespectful thing a fighter can do is not make weight i yeah it's like a it's a huge advantage and it's just like uh yeah i think it's like a kick in the face like eugene's like pretty adamant against it like um yeah he's like pretty vocal about it um yeah i'm not i'm not at all happy about it you cheat like essentially you're cheating to me that's 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 car park rules, like, regardless of how the fight goes. <laughs> like, you, you must wait, you know, we're going to sort that out in the car park, brother. Like, there's there's some something else that needs to be done about that. Like, I'm not going to sit out here and complain about it. Like, I'm going to, yeah, so I'm going to do something about it. Sorry for the ignorant question, but what happens if you don't make weight? The, the fight still uh, goes ahead. Kinda, yeah, it kind of depends on, um, like, what state you're in. Like, has, like, an impact on that. And generally speaking, it's um, 20% of your purse, and that's it. Like, so you lose 20% of your purse. But, like, yeah, I guess the big kick in the nuts is, like, some of these guys, like, they don't make money from, like, their purse. Or, like, their purse is, like, play money. Like, especially, like, uh, the Middle Eastern guys or especially, like, uh, like the Dazakhstani guys, like, where their government pays for them to live like they'll they'll want to fight they'll go back and they'll have like a brand new mercedes waiting at the airport that that you know the dictator of Dazakhstan's like giving them and shit like that it's it's wild you know what i mean like jacinda won't even let me in the bloody country like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the bit of kicking the nuts but like to them like say it's like their ufc debut like you think they give a shit about like a couple of grand like they don't when they get like a huge advantage so it's just um yeah what can you do, you know? Mm. Um, I, sorry, I forgot what I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about head trauma, CTE. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's one that um, rugby is dealing with big time at the moment, and it's kind of the game is trying to figure out how it can survive with what we know about head injuries. I know how seriously you guys take it, and I know we sort of spoke at the start about – spider and, and the different forms that you go to protect yourself but how much does it weigh on your mind about what your future might look like with the <laughs> amount of knocks that you take uh, it's like something you definitely have to be um very present about very honest um with yourself about and like i do the most like precautions that you can do you know like i, I definitely am pretty um versed in like concussion protocol and coming back after concussion and stuff like that just because you obviously understand that a concussion is like a bruise. So obviously if you have like a huge bruise on your arm and you keep like poking that bruise every day, it's just like not going to heal. Like if you just don't take that time to recover from the concussion, um, you're just making it worse. Like you keep pressing that bruise, it's just kind of uh, continue like a concussion is a, your brain is inflamed, your brain is bru bruised. It needs that time um, to, to fully recover. So every time that I've had a concussion or concussion symptoms, I take the time away from the sport and uh, and come through properly the concussion protocols to ensure that that concussion is like fully 
recovered before you put yourself back in that conflictual um, situation where something like that might happen again. So you're obviously like reducing it as much as you possibly can, but you have to understand that I know the sport that I'm playing, like I'm not ignorant of the fact like whatsoever. I understand there's, there's a huge risk involved in it, but I understand it's like there's risks involved in everything, you know, like um, some of my friends work in a paint factory. Like, <laughs> you know, guys drink, uh, you know, you, there's, you eat KFC every night. You, they say you're probably going to get cancer. You know, the, you do, there's like, uh, there's inherent risk involved in um, whatever you choose to do. And it's like, this is at the stage I'm at now, um, like I'm good. I'm not feeling any kind of concussion symptoms or stuff like that. And I'm doing my utmost best. I'm completely aware of the position that it, it potentially might put in, like once you read some of these studies. Um, but at the point where you're just going to not do anything, you know what I mean? Like you're going to you're gonna just go, oh, no, this is too much for me. Put the sport down, step away, not provide for your family, um, not live like a life you're incredibly passionate about not wake up every day doing something that you want to do not loving the training not loving the fighting not like this is what i'm here for this is something that i just love regardless of um and yeah like i guess i'm in the same boat as everyone else as we'll we'll see because i don't think we've seen a combat sport like mma in this um in this public of an arena and so well established. Like I don't feel like the UFC is going absolutely anywhere. So we're gonna I'm I'm in the boat as everyone else. Like we're gonna see how this generation of people come down because we've obviously seen, you know, the Wolf Smith movie concussion. We we're all doing crazy shit. Like we we will see. And obviously if that's where the sport goes, then this is the last generation of fighters i believe like if that's how it, we all turn out then i feel like this is the last generation of um people that, that we can as like the human race can let people go and do this like if that is truly um the outcome of the sport then it has to be you have to save people it's like anything it's like any other uh, inherently risky thing we have to save people from themselves so we'll we'll see we'll, we'll see in MMA, but also in other sports too. I mean, even football, like hitting the ball, is under mm. um, the sort of microscope about what. It so that's it, it. Like, where are we? Yeah, like that's uh, only time will tell. Like, where we actually are going to draw the line because combat uh, with combat sports, um, like head trauma has been. We've been very aware of it for a very long time. Like everyone has seen, obviously, like as huge of a figure as like Muhammad Ali, you know what I mean? And, and to see his health deteriorate, like there is not a fighter walking the face of the planet that has not seen Muhammad Ali and what, what the sport of boxing, um, how that deteriorated his health. So I feel like with combat sports, especially uh, we've known about head trauma and, and the dangers of it and have been doing the best we possibly can to, to limit that with, you know, not, fighting and training and not sparring and taking concussions and training and wearing headgear and doing what we and you know taking time off when guys get knocked out in fights like doing all the utmost we possibly can but i feel like in you know like rugby rugby league and stuff like that it's only just now like coming to the forefront like i feel like it's like a very new thing like even when i was playing like guys would get knocked out and they were like get up bro like get back out there you know like that's because they were very ignorant of the long-term effects of concussions yeah how, how much has it changed since 2008 9 10 whatever compared to 2022 the precautions you guys are taking you're obviously thinking about it a lot was it the same back then was it wild wild west um nah like uh, definitely not like we we knew the whole time we knew the whole time like getting knocked out is not good for you like <laughs> <laughs> it's not yeah. like it's it's always it's always been a part like obviously we're much more careful now with it or like the 
back to sport protocol is um, much more stringent than it was or much more scientific and much more qualified um, than it was back then. But it's always been a part of our sport. Like it's always been a risk that um, you had to take into account of doing combat sports. Like it's um, like I've even gone through because I was like jumped on uh, – ACC gave me like a ten thousand dollar bill, and I was like, oh, "Man, I'm gonna get you guys back for this." <laughs> so then, like after one fight, I like went on ACC because I had a concussion from that Barboza fight, and I, I went on ACC for that. And it's just, yeah, like going to a, like a concussion physiotherapist and stuff like that, and seeing like the um, the protocols we have here in New Zealand was pretty like reassuring. But yeah, same thing. She's like, "Do you have any other skills?" I was like, "Not really." <laughs> She's like, "How many concussions have you had in your life? Yeah. More than two? And I was like, <laughs> two. Yeah. yeah, I've had a few." Um, do, does your wife watch your fights? She's actually a pretty cool way. She's actually a bit of a gangster. Like she was. I think we weren't even dating. I think we've been. I'd taken out uh, a couple of times for dinner when she was at the. Um, the Christmas bash, well, I fought the boys and she come down that, you know. So she's been, yeah, she knows I'm a bit of a wild man and she's like full well <laughs> accepted like that aspect of my life. And, but, and is Zoe your daughter? Yeah. yeah. Is she old enough to, do you keep her away from nah, from like Daddy's she'll, she Nah, she'll come down the gym and she, she's actually got like no, absolutely no interest in like conflict or fighting or doesn't like hit the other kids but she watches more UFC fights than most grown men like she <laughs> she posts up she posts up Sunday with dad like eating yeah. chips and watching UFC but yeah she's like the girliest girl like coolest cool like yeah it's the same thing like I believe like you can't you can't steer people towards the sport and you can't steer them away from the sport it's just it's just um, it's either in you or it's not your business is fighting Instagram is a huge part of that. You've got 440,000 followers on Instagram. How much thought do you put into that, into posts and stories and things? Is that is that part of your package? None. None. Yeah. Like, I just... <laughs> 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 like, you kind of just uh, post up what you... Um, yeah, like, I, I, that's, like, that's me. That's mine. I don't have... Um, there's, like, a lot of fighters that don't do their own social media because they're just, like... Oh, I don't like the mean things people say, or I don't like they don't like to spend like the mental energy on it. But I, I honestly like just don't use that much. I actually don't think about. It. Like, I get my wife to spell check my shit because I can't spell with anything, you know. But besides that, like, there's not that much thought that goes into it. Like, I'll just be like, I'm at the gym, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and put up a video. Like, I'm at the gym. Like, it's just like that's um like genuinely my account. Like, everyone's everyone's got like Instagram, right? Like. I just not everyone's got four hundred and forty thousand people <laughs> following. <Yeah. laughs> I'm always just fascinated by that. You do a little stupid video or something, and you're like, "Yeah, hundred thousand people watch that." We buzz when we get like a hundred likes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we like don't get that, that often. Uh, one of the like one of the boys will like do a video and like giving me shit, like, "Oh, caught you doing this," and I'm just I'll do it back to them, and it's like, "Yeah, I got a hundred thousand views on my one," <laughs> and they're like, "Yeah, I got bombarded with messages." Yeah. Uh, one of your posts yesterday, like you said, was a bit of a tease. Um, I can't imagine you're going to announce it here on Between Two Beers, but is there an <laughs> announcement coming soon? Well, I'm on uh, Israel's card, which is November November 12th, Madison Square Garden in New York. So I was in New York in uh, December. So that'll be cool, man. It's all it's always cool when like Israel fights, like the the um the like build up around the fights is like just crazy, man. Like everyone just gets so um, behind it. And just the the eyes he brings to the sport is like crazy to see. So me, I think Brad Riddell's fights got announced on that one as well. Oh, it has been announced. Yeah, yeah. I th well the other bloke announced it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah well, the other bloke. I want to fight that bloke. Me and the bloke had a few arguments in the past, but um, yeah, Brad's fighting, Israel's fighting, I'm fighting. I don't know if any of the other boys will get on that card as well. But yeah, November twelfth. Uh, I'm fighting a bloke. I'll tell you if I knew his name. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's a, he's a, I don't know. He's a knee bar guy. He's got like a few. Oh, yeah. He's yeah, got okay. a few bit knee bit bars. Bit of a, yeah, tricky, bit of a tricky one. Yeah, 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 yeah it'll yeah. be a, a funny one. But yeah, he's always, uh, 
I don't want to butcher his name. Yeah. Fair <laughs> does, does that make it? Does that make that card better for you guys having all of you on that same card? Like, is that is that shared excitement? Yeah, something? yeah, yeah. There's like pros and cons to everything. Obviously, when you like do it all on yourself, like you got, you know. It's all on you, but it's the same thing as like once you have the boys there, especially when Israel's there, like the treatment you get is like cool as, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's giving you free shit and <laughs> it's cool. You'll be opening up your sports lounge for that one, Shay? Come around? November? Uh, yeah, November potentially, yeah. Yeah, kids yeah, allowed? Yeah. Uh, no, no kids okay. allowed. Okay. So <laughs> my, my, just the, back, the backstory to that for you is uh, I don't have kids. Um, when my mum goes away, then Sundays are free for yeah. UFC. But I have a very firm no kids allowed in the no sports kids. lounge, so Stephen no never kids. gets to come around. Yeah, harsh. <laughs> firm, firm but fair. Yeah. Um, Dan, that's been awesome, man. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I have run to the end of my list of notes, but Shay, have you got any little little pits or you just want to get to the outro? I'll try and get to the outro. Stephen throws the outro to me every week. <laughs> um the hardest part the yeah, outro yeah, everyone's it tired it actually, you know? yeah, yeah. it's like a fight and then Joe Rogan just shoves yeah, a mic I'll in smash, yeah I'll smash an intro but uh, an outro yeah. oh. no look I just can't wait to get Israel Adesanya on here um, shoot yeah. my, I was just trying to shoot my shot um, yeah, no. everyone, everyone messaged me like I've got like any kind of influence on what he does yeah. they're like so if you could yeah. get Israel I'm like bro don't even bother <laughs> don't even bother no um, I found you in the research for this one of the like most genuinely fascinating and interesting characters in New Zealand sport. I, f I find you so articulate and I could like I found myself like I do with most episodes that I really enjoy just sitting and listening and then interjecting occasionally but just really captivated by your thoughts on the sport, your thoughts on life and your ability to, for your personality to shine through and I mm. find it amazing that you can be so articulate outside but also such a an influence inside when you fight and i genuinely wish you the best of luck and i really look forward to that card in november thank and you, seeing you, you back uh, back in action so all the very best and um thanks for sharing some time with us no, it's been a pleasure lads thank you very much i appreciate it cheers then <laughs>